If you would, open in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We are going to pick up uh, from the pen of Peter and, and notice this section of Scripture that as we look at it, he really talks about in this section of Scripture us being good stewards of the grace of God. Good stewards of the grace of God. Let's go ahead and read the chapter uh, to uh, just get the entirety in our mind and then we'll come back and look at uh, the verses individually. But Peter begins this chapter, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer, or excuse me, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, and that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matter. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Before we actually go down and, and look at it verse by verse, were there, were there any things that kind of jumped off the page as we were reading that to you that uh, kind of struck you as interesting? If you, if you try to win people, you're going to have to reproach. Okay. People will look down on you. They will avoid you. Okay. But that's nothing to what could happen. Okay. And what those countries are suffering already. Okay. So, so if you're trying to live right and do right and uh, trying to reach out with the message of the gospel, you are many times going to be reproached. You're going to be rejected. But as Sister Wilma said, that, that's really nothing that should shock us because it's gone on before. It's going on right now. And it's worse in some places. 
As a matter of fact, I read an article this week, and, it, and, it, and it's talking about when it uses the word Christian, not in the general sense that the world uses it, but it's written by a brother in Christ, and he was talking about the persecution that brethren are going through right now in Afghanistan. Uh, when we pulled out and left that country, of course, the Taliban took over, and uh, one of the things that they, they want to do is stamp out Christianity. So uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan and other countries right now are suffering greatly uh, for the cause of Christ. And uh, we need to remember them in our prayers. We need to remember that the things that we're going through, well, they, they're not that much. All right, anything else? Anything that caught your attention, you said, wow, what is, what is that? All right, if not, we'll go ahead and break it down verse by verse. As we said, the, the theme of this chapter really is encouraging us to be good stewards of the grace of God. What, what do you think that message, remember we read it a moment ago, as good stewards, verse number 10, of the manifold grace of God. So when we look at that, Peter is telling us that, that we need to be good stewards. What is a steward? Okay, a caretaker. Someone that takes care of something for someone else. If you are a steward on a ship, you take care of that ship, but it doesn't belong to you. If you are a steward on a farm or a ranch, you take care of the animals, the farm. It doesn't belong to you, so you're taking care. A steward takes care of something that does not belong to them. And so Peter uses that adjective, we've got to be good stewards. Uh, that implies, of course, there are bad stewards, and of course we know that. There are those that, uh, even in the, the realm of the physical and the here and now, there are people that uh, they've been given stewardships, whether it's in a bank or whatever it is, they've been given a trust, and they don't, they don't discharge their duty very well. And, and then we recognize that in the spiritual realm, not everyone who is a steward of God is a good steward of God. There are some that uh, we would say are bad stewards of God. So when he says this, he wants us to be good caretakers. Notice this, of the manifold, and we talked about that word before, literally it's many folds. So, so if you get something that's in the mail, it may be trifolded, and it, it, it's got many different folds, it's, and you unfold it. And, and Peter is saying that's the way it is with the grace of God. There are so many different pages that we can unfold that talk about the grace of God. And so he says, I want you to be good stewards of the manifold, the many-folded grace of God. So let's go ahead and go back to verse number one. Peter begins this, and remember the theme of this book is that children of God need to stand up and suffer without murmuring and complaining. Uh, you remember that this book is written, if we get the dates right, probably sometime from 60 to 65 A.D. What's going to happen in 70 A.D.? The destruction of Jerusalem. Destruction of Jerusalem. When did that... Uh, we know that the destruction of Jerusalem took place in AD 70. When did the campaign to get to Jerusalem, when did it start affecting the nation of Israel? In 67 AD. So it was a three year campaign. And they actually came and they marched and they surrounded the city of uh, Jerusalem and that siege itself was about 18 months. So, so this is a three-year campaign, and Peter is warning them, look, hard times are coming. And it's not only going to be hard times on the sinners, but it's going to be hard times on the saints as well. It's going to be a difficult time for them to live in. And you remember 
uh, that you can go back to Matthew chapter 24 and you remember that as he is leaving the temple in Matthew chapter 24, uh, his disciples encourage him to stop and look back at the temple. And, and as we've talked about, the temple is a marble structure. It had marble stones that some of them weighed 100 tons. And so it was this beautiful marble structure and had brass and gold and silver and different colors of skins of animals. It was a glorious structure. But you remember that Jesus told them all these things that you're looking at are going to be knocked down and destroyed. And you remember that they asked him in verse number three, when is that going to happen? And are there going to be any signs to that? And of course, Jesus, beginning in verse 4, tells them about the signs that are going to come to point to the destruction of Jerusalem. But you remember that in verse number 36 of that chapter, he begins to answer the third question. The third question was, when are you coming back again? When are you coming back to conquer Satan and uh, restore things to the way that God intended for them to be. And you remember he said, no man knows that day. He said the angels in heaven don't know. Jesus at that point being limited by the flesh said, I myself don't know, but only the Father knows. So the, the, the Jewish people, the Christians that had obeyed the gospel, they are already starting to see the signs that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be great earthquakes. There's going to be uh, civil upheavings that are going on. And so Peter is writing to them just prior to all of this really coming to fruition. If, it, if it's right, some have said probably 65 AD is uh, a pretty precise date. Then that's two years before this campaign against the nation of Israel is going to begin. And so Peter is warning them, look, hard times are coming. It's going to get very bad. And you're going to suffer. And you're going to suffer not only as a Jew, but you're also going to suffer as a Christian because you remember Jesus said that brother's going to turn against brother. Sister's going to turn against sister. There's going to be family wars that are taking place. And so Jesus warned them about that. And now Peter is saying, these things are about to happen. So it says in verse number one, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. Now we realize that Jesus did come in the flesh. We've talked about this before. And John is going to really address this in his writings, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But there was a notion at the time that John is writing that Jesus did not come in the flesh. And of course, the, the notion behind that was there was a segment of the people that believed that uh, flesh was inherently sinful. And so their argument was, well, since flesh is inherently sinful, this is their argument, not what the Bible says and not what, what's right, but since the flesh, they said, is inherently sinful, Jesus could not come in the flesh because if he came in the flesh, then he would be sinful. And they, they understood that Jesus was sinless. And so their answer to the question was he didn't come in the flesh. And so they would say he had the appearance of flesh, that he looked like flesh, but he really wasn't. Some even suggested that he was more kind of a, an apparition, that, that, that he was a spirit, and that, that really you couldn't touch him and do those things. We, we all understand that's false. But Peter says, look, since Christ suffered for us, in the flesh. It's going to be a, a statement as you read the New Testament. Notice how over and over again the writers talk about what Jesus did in the flesh. And that's to answer this false doctrine that is around. 
But now notice this is a line of argumentation. Since Jesus, our Savior, our King, our High Priest, since He suffered in the flesh, we must, He says, arm ourselves likewise with the same mind. What, is, what does He mean when He says with the same mind? Okay, willing to suffer. Having the mind of Christ. You remember Paul would say in Philippians 2, in verse number 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And he goes in and he talks about Jesus and his humility. And, and he, he left heaven. He came, he walked among men. He took on the form of a man. But not only did he come as a man, he came as a what? A servant of men. I'm sorry. Okay, God in the flesh, and, and that's right, but I'm talking about he came as a suffering servant. So let this mind be in you. So arm yourselves with the same mind. Jesus knew when he left heaven what was going to happen to him. You think about that. You know, we often talk about uh, men, and when I say men, I'm talking about mankind in general. But, uh, you know, a lot of times we will hold up someone uh, in the military uh, that has done some great thing. Maybe they've gone behind, deep behind enemy lines and, and, you know, they've done this great thing and maybe they even got a medal of honor or something like this. We, we often lift them up and, and rightfully so, you know. Uh, we admire that kind of thing. We, we look at it. And, and we say, we marvel. And they knew when they went on that mission that it was highly likely they were going to come back alive. Well, Jesus knew that when he left heaven. He knew when he came to this earth that he was going to die. And I can't imagine, I can't wrap my mind around that thought that God is going to die for us. Now we understand what I'm saying when I say that. I know it was his humanness that died, but he knew that was going to happen. He knew he was going to be rejected. He knew he was going to suffer. He knew he was going to be spit upon, mocked, ridiculed. He knew all that, and he still did. And what was that scripture? For a good man, some would die, but... Um... He goes on to say that Jesus died for sinners. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to think of where that is. Uh, I believe it's in the book of Romans, and, and you caught me off guard. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Uh, hmm. Yeah, but we, we know the verse that you're talking about that uh, uh, for a, a, a good man, some or would, would die. I, I can't remember now because I've got this word in. For a good man, some of you dare to die, but Christ died for sinners. Okay. I think it says such as for the unrighteous. Yeah. As John and Ramses would say, <laughs> go home and read the whole Bible tonight. That's, that's right. <laughs> Just one second. Let me tap this in and see if I can't find it. Because I I tell you, I've said this before recently, but my forgiver gets to working better and better. Uh, let's... In all the period of time that you're talking about that Christ came, yes. he suffered all those things that you mentioned. Uh -huh. He also knew that his father was on his son. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Yeah. So he could he could have his mentality of for, in the forefront that all these things were happening to him. Yes. But inside, he still had the reserve thought, my God is with me. And, and that's the reason that the Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that we need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We have Jesus. We have God. And so that's exactly right. You had uh, a military person in mind a while ago, and I thought of General Patton. Yes. And his European exploits. Yes. And yeah. 
he was asked by some journalist, do you read the Bible? And he says, oh, oh. <laughs> no, that's wrong. Uh, but I know he said Romans 5, verse 6 and 7. Okay, that, that sounds right. Romans 5, 6 and 7. For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So absolutely. And the point is, Jesus knew what was going to happen. And so he says, you've got to arm yourself with that same mind. And then he makes this statement in verse 1, For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. What is, what is he saying in that statement that we've suffered in the flesh and ceased from sin? What does it mean that we've suffered in the flesh? Or that he that hath suffered in the flesh? What is he talking about? The one that has been tested and tried in battle. That's, the, we've done, you know, uh, it goes back to that uh, notion that, that going back to the analogy of the soldier and, and the soldier, once they've been in battle, then they know what that feels like. And so the next time, they're not, you know, they're not in that same mindset because they know what to expect. And that's what Peter is telling us. We have suffered in the flesh. And that leads us to stop sinning because we know that there is a glory that is going to come our way. And so then he says in verse number two that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So what is he telling us in verse 2? The one that suffers from in the flesh stops sinning. He no longer lives the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men. What does that mean? We shouldn't try to please men. We should try to, our focus should be on God. Okay. Stop. Okay. A lot of times we want to do what other men say, but we should be listening to God and do what He tells us. Okay. Remember what David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And then later down he says, but it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn the precepts. And, and I think that's exactly what this is talking about. Once when we when we go through the, that suffering, it helps us focus our mind because if we're honest, a lot of times we suffer it's because of our own mistakes and weaknesses and sins. And we realize, you know what? There's something that is more precious than just as he said, Living to the lust of men. What is what does the word lust mean? Desire. Strong desires. Yeah, it's those those strong desires. And uh, you know, uh, there are things that maybe you've done in the past that you don't do anymore, but there's triggers, you know, that bring those thoughts back. And and you you that trigger comes up in your life. Oh man, I used to, and then you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. But it's it's Satan using your mind, using those triggers to bring it back. So Peter is telling us, look, you've got to get your mind right. You're about to go into battle. That really is the focus of what he's talking about. Hard times are coming. You're about to go through these fiery trials that he mentioned a moment ago. So you've got to get your mind right. And you've got to stop living to the, the strong desires that are out there in the world. And you've got to live to the will of God. So here is the stark contrast between the sinner and saint. Here's the contrast between the Christian and the non-Christian. 
the sinner and the non-Christian live their lives to the lust of men. They're, they're guided by earthly, worldly, sensual things. And we all know it's true. You, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to even be very sharp to know that when you walk out into the world and you start looking around and you start listening to the conversations that are going on around you, it doesn't take you very long to realize, look, these people are walking after the flesh and not after the spirit. That's the way Paul says it in Romans chapter 8. So we can no longer as children of God live according to the lust of men. We now are going to live by the will of God. And that's what Brenda was saying a moment ago. We, 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 there is a change. But notice this. It is a mindset. Do you remember Paul in Romans 12 and verse number 2? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And, and, and you know, the word conformed means to be molded. And, and you think about jello or something, you, you get that mold and you pour that jello in it when it's in the liquid state and you let it harden and then you take it and you, you turn it over and you dump it out and, and it retains the shape of the mold, whatever that was. If it was, you know, an angel or a hippopotamus, whatever you made that jello look like when you take the mold off, that's, that's what shaped it. And that's the word conformed. But he says, but be ye transformed. And you know this, but the word transformed uh, is from the Greek word. We get our English word metamorphosis. And it's the description of the caterpillar changing into the butterfly. And that's the life of a Christian. We were a lowly caterpillar, and we come out of the cocoon, baptized into Christ, the old man dies, the new man right, and it's like that butterfly coming out of the cocoon. That's the transformation in the child of God. But he says we do this by the renewing of our mind. So this is what Peter is, this is the proverbial pep talk. This is the speech before the troops go into battle. This is the call to arms. This is the coach that's in the locker room in the Super Bowl and the team that he's coaching is behind and he's giving them that speech to get them fired up and ready to go out and fight. That's what Peter's doing. He's giving us this and he said, you've got to stop living according to the world and you've got to start living by the will of God. Why? Because the judgment is about to come. And that judgment is not the final day of judgment. That's that destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about that when we get to that verse. So he said, look, this is the hard time that you're about to go through. So get your mind right. Get ready for this. Don't allow the things of this world to creep in and, and corrupt your mind and take you away from the will of God. So we no longer live, he says, according to the flesh. Now notice the contrast. He says in verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. That's the lust of men that he talked about back in verse number 2. The will of the Gentiles. Uh, you can go to Romans chapter 1 and you can see how Paul described the life of the Gentiles. Let's do that very quickly. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. And notice, as Paul's writing about the power of the gospel, and he says in verse number 21, speaking of the Gentiles, he says that when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, but they became, he says, vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness 
through the lust of their own hearts. Now notice this, God, it's almost like God shook his hand and said, okay, go ahead and do it. That's what you, have you ever done that with your children? You got so frustrated with them at that point, you said, well, just go ahead and do it then. And then they run into the ball and they start crying. They're like, duh, that's what I've been trying to tell you all along, but you had to see for yourself. So God says that the Gentiles look, they, they uh, did this, and God gave them over to the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor, we're in verse 24, their own bodies between themselves. They changed, verse 25, the truth of God into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them over to vile affections, that's the lust of men that Peter is talking about, to vile affections, verse 26, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Uh, he says what they're doing is so ungodly that it's against the very nature of the human body, what they're doing. He's talking about lesbianism, homosexuality, and those things that we see in the world and he says, look, the women took what was natural and they used it in an unnatural, ungodly way. Verse 27, and likewise also men, leaving the natural use of a woman. That's talking about the sexual relationship. We're not going to be, uh, you know, that's what he's talking about. He says, it is natural and right for a man to be with a woman. That's the way God designed it. But now the Gentiles, he says, they went against the natural use of the woman. They burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. That's the homosexuality that he's talking about. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was made. I want to pause there and just remind us that when you abuse your body the way homosexuals and others that are into these perverse things, when you do that to the human body, there will always be effects. It's going to have some effect upon you. It's going to affect you in some way. You're going to have diseases. And, and, and we can hide all day and say that it's not true, but we all know that AIDS became an epidemic because of homosexuality. Now, that's just a fact. And, I, and I'm not trying to be flippant or political when I say this. Contrary to what Dr. Fauci said back then, he was the head epidemiologist when AIDS was rampant in California, and he said, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with homosexual conduct. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And so they, they use the body in unnatural ways, and there are diseases that are going to come from that. And so Paul is telling us, look, you do things like that, there is a price to be paid. He says in verse 28, and it's they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Wonder why they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. Guilty, guilty, guilty. They don't want the guilt associated with God. By the way, we're living in times right now where there are a lot of people that don't want to acknowledge God exists simply for the fact they don't want to be guilty of sin and they know what they're doing is wrong and they just say, well, there's no God. And that's their act. Well, they're going to wake up one day dead and they're going to find out there is a God and he's going to judge them for what they've done. So he says, they uh, left, the verse 28, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, did you see the other day they had the video of the, the girl that gave birth to that child, put that child in the bag, and threw that child in the dumpster? They got, they got it on video. The child, when they recovered the child, the child was already dead. 
They've got our own video. Can you imagine a mother taking that little child? I don't know if the child had been stillborn. I don't think that the child was born dead. I think the child was alive. Put that little child in a bag and throw that child in the dumpster. That's what he's talking about when you don't have natural affection. There's not a mother in their right mind. And when I say right mind, I'm not saying that she's excused, but I don't know who she is, don't know anything about her, and she may have severe mental problems. But I'm saying in the right mind in the sense that you're thinking right, you're thinking clearly, you're thinking no mother's going to do that unless you've allowed your mind to be turned over to the devil. And then you're not going to have natural affection, he says. They're implacable. That means they can't be satisfied. They're unmerciful. That's what we're talking about. Who knowing the judgment of God, which they that commit such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. So go back to what Peter said in verse 3, In the time past of our life, we wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walk in lasciviousness, what is lasciviousness? You hear that word lascivious, what do you think of? Sinful. Evil living, evil thoughts, uh, a licentious person. He says lasciviousness, lust. That goes back to what he said in verse 22, the lust of men. That's that strong desire. Lust. He says excess of wine. What is that? Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Uh, we were in the men's Bible class yesterday, and one of the men made the comment that his dad was an alcoholic. And one of the other men said, well, my dad was drunk. And he said, and he was not a nice drunk. He was the mean drunk. He said he didn't go down and somebody tell him he had a disease that was alcohol. He said he was just a mean drunk. And I think sometimes we give people a pass. Well, they're an alcoholic. Well, like this brother said, no, they're just a mean drunk. That's what they are. And they turn their mind over to those kinds of things. And so they're living in drunkenness, revelings. What is revelings? Party. Party. Uh, uh, we look at, and I, I guess uh, you'll know I'm from the south and from this area when I say pasture party. Did anybody ever heard that term before? We're going to have a pasture party. Uh, and, of course, what that means is that was what all the kids did. They'd all bring the beer and their booze and the radio, and they'd go out to somebody's pasture, uh, and they would have this drunken party. That's what the word is. Reference. It's this drunken party. Uh, we would look at it like this, and I've talked about this before. One of my cousins married a Catholic, and we went to the wedding. I was young. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. I don't know how old I was. But we went down to Houston. That's where the, the marriage took place. And, uh, of course, my uncle was footing the bill for all this. It's drinks. Everybody, that's when I, I told the story about the Catholic priest getting so drunk that they had to carry him to the car and drive him home and get him out and get him in his home and get him in his bed. That's reverence. That's these parties where it's nothing but drunkenness revelings. He says banquetings. That's 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 kind of more like the wedding, I guess. The revelings is the pasture party. The banqueting is the, the more uppity affair. <laughs> we're going to do this in a motel, not in a pasture. You know, we're going to rent a center and we're going to do this. But it's all sur uh, surrounding this idea of the use of alcohol and, it, and drugs. We would say it in a general sense in drugs. And abominable idolatries. So as long as it's just idolatry, it's okay as long as it's not abominable idolatries, right? <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. But what, what Peter is doing is using these words for emphasis. He's trying to get us to understand it is an abomination in the sight of God for someone to fall down in front of an idol and worship that idol. 
And 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 Peter or excuse me, Paul talked about it over in Romans chapter one. They changed the image of God. The image of the uncorruptible God. They changed him into corruptible things like birds and and uh, alligators and you know all these things. And we talked about it, you know, recently when we're in the book of Judges and, and we come across those phrases about the groves. And we said what that really is is where they made what we call totem poles, and then they bow down and worship it. And Isaiah talked about how foolish it is for a man to go down. Cut wood, cut a tree out of the woods, drag that tree home, cut part of it up to build a desk, cut part of it up to cook his supper, cut part of it up to warm himself, and then take another part of that and make a statue and out and then bow down and worship that right now. How silly is that? And yet that's what people do. So he says these abominable idolatries. And then he says in verse number four, wherein they, that's the world, and I've got up here our old friends, and I'm using that as we lived in the world, those people that we used to run around with, if you've lived in the world, you know what I'm talking about. They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, what's this speaking evil of you? So what are your friends doing now? They see you in a different light that, that you've changed and they don't know why. That's right. And they're like, you, are you a Bible pumper now? Is that what you want? Well, I guess you're Mr. Goody Two-Shoes now. And you're not going to sit and be with us anymore. You're not going to drink with us and smoke with us and party with us anymore. You just think you're better than everybody. You think you're a saint or something, don't you? You ever read that out? that lived in New Jersey and became a Christian, although he was not very really strong. But he told his brother, I became a Christian, he said, so now you moved to the South hmm. and now you believe in God. Yeah. And I said, does your brother not believe in God? He said, no. He said, I don't know if my parents did. Jewish, Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's very common today because they actually call it secular Judaism. And it, and it's a it's not it's not a, a religious connotation at all. It is a national thing. Like we would call ourselves an American. They call themselves Jewish. They don't believe in God. They don't have any concept of what the, the Bible teaches about things. But they said, well, I'm Jew. Well, what are they, what are they, they're saying, I'm an American. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the way they're used. It doesn't have a religious connotation whatsoever. They use it as a secular statement. I am a descendant of Israel. I, I am come from Israel. I'm a Jew. But that it's not a religious thing at all. So it's quite common in secular Judaism right now. Or I don't want to say secular Judaism, secular Jews, atheists is rank, atheism is rank. Uh, by the way, you get into some of the liberal denominations and you start getting up into the upper echelon, the men and women that are running those groups, and you start talking to them. I talked about Bishop Joseph Sprague. He was over the seven states of the Midwest in the uh, Methodist Church. Didn't believe in the virgin birth. Didn't believe that Jesus was God. And he's running. He is the head bishop, or he was. I don't know if he's still around or not. Head bishop. He was running a business. He was a business, not a church. And that's what I was saying a moment ago. It's a secular kind of thing. He's running a business. He doesn't believe anything. He's just running the business. Did you have a comment? No. Okay. He's just running the business. That's all they're doing. And that's where they're using that. Uh, but Joseph Sprague was, I mean, homosexual, done the homosexual way. They all kinds of stuff. And yet he was their head bishop. So uh, you're going to see that. So I'm going to read verse 5. We'll pick up there, Lord willing, next week. He says, Who shall give account to him that is ready 
to judge the quick and the dead. Now we know the word quick there means living. So he says these people are doing all these things that they want to do and they're going to have to give an account. They're going to have to give an account. They're dead while they live. Remember Paul would say that in 1st Timothy chapter 5 speaking of the younger women who uh, they just gave themselves over. They were Christians but they just went kind of went back into the world. He says they're they're dead while they're walking is the way that he, he describes they're, they're They're still alive, but they're dead. And then, of course, the quick, that's the living, that's us. So we come. All right, we're paused there. That leads us to a good thought, or at least maybe a pertinent thought. Where are you in this picture that Peter is painting? Are you dead or are you alive? Are you walking to the flesh? Are you walking to the will of God? And we've got to answer that question. And it may be this evening that you're answering that question in the negative. You're saying, no, I'm not a Christian. Well, we know that you've got to hear the word of God, believe that word, repent of your sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. God will add you to the church. So if you haven't done that, Brother Britt's going to be leading us in an invitation song and we plead with you to respond. Or as a child of God, if you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing. Um.